Hello, and welcome to the Freeman Perspective. Well, tonight we're going to talk about geomancy. Could it be that our leaders are encoding secret things into the architecture? Uh, my beginning of my trip was in Orlando, Florida, my hometown, where they blew up City Hall for the movie Lethal Weapon. And then out in front of City Hall, they erected a large phallus that many of the Denzians of Orlando were curious about. This happens to stand right across the street from the Bohemian Hotel. Now, just to the right of this phallus, we find what can only be described as, well, a gushing vagina. Because what we're finding is that the symbols and the signs incorporated into the architecture of our nation's capitals and government buildings are actually dedicated to a god and goddess. So as we see here, what we have is Aphrodite. And this is coupled with Hermes. Now, this is where we get the word hermaphrodite. And this is, is given out in the Tarot as the magician card and as the empress. And what we'll find is that each of the Tarot cards has significance in this geomancy. Now the hermaphroditic symbols are given uh, to us through popular culture. And what we'll see is that many of the pop icons are actually representations of this hermaphroditic symbol such as Prince's symbol being a symbol of Mars crossed with the symbol of Venus, and then crossed with a hyperdimensional coil. Madonna being a Kabbalist also uh, inculcates the uh, idea of the hermaphrodite, much as the symbol of Janet Jackson bearing her breast is a symbol of the goddess, whereas the golden sundial on her nipple is the god or the hermaphroditic symbol of the god and goddess. Now these are known as Nimrod and Queen Semiramis. Nimrod is sometimes known as Bel and is often shown as such. And you will find these gods and goddesses put together as obelisks and archways, but then they also incorporate what is known as sacred geometry. Now, many of the cathedrals that were built in the medieval times were considered alchemical books in stone, where things were encoded into these structures to pass down through time, so that those of the initiates, those initiated in the esoteric orders, could decipher these and bring these ideas throughout time. Now, one of the main things that are incorporated is these concepts of sacred geometry. Now you'll find that the people involved in this are often shown wearing certain vestments and also carrying magic wands. These people are very ceremonial and ritual in nature. They obsess themselves with symbols they are very concerned with time and the calendar. And they also follow the course of the sun quite obsessively. So I thought I'd go back to where it all began. I went to the oldest city in America, known as St. Augustine. I thought perhaps if I went to the beginning of this nation, I might be able to find some clues. Well, as synchronicity would have it, I found myself sitting at Athena's restaurant, and I became quite good friends with the owner there. I still talk to him today. But just outside of Athena's and across the street is the courtyard of St. Augustine. And in this courtyard, we find quite interesting things, such as this statue. And this is a statue of Ponce de Leon, where he landed in 1513. And they erected many edifices to honor themselves. Now perhaps, 
Being that this man was only four foot eleven inches tall, this might explain why he felt the need to construct so many erections. Because St. Augustine is covered in obelisks. I found them everywhere. There are three in this park alone, and always the members putting their gang signs on them, which just happens to be the Masonic compass and square. But these obelisks aren't only identified by the Freemasons. Here we find also a cross adorning this one. And up at the top of which, it has cannonballs as its capstone. And this is a monument to signify our dead, period. But don't let these symbols fool you because these men had no real concern for human safety or life because this particular obelisk stands over what's known now as the slave market. Once you recognize that our leaders are not who you think they are and that they have no concern for the human well-being, that they can buy and sell humans at will, and you'll start to understand because these are the warmongers building large fortresses in order to conquer lands. But they seem to find their roots back in ancient Atlantis and the merfolk. So as you see this merman on this cannon which is in the fortress and of course the fish monsters adorning it. But who is it that owns this cannon? Well, it just happens to be uh, Yale University. Hmm, isn't that where the Skull and Bones Society is? Where the CIA was formed? So I thought I'd look a little deeper. And there's a man named Flagler that owns much of St. Augustine. And this is his college. And I found the campus surrounded by implements of destruction with spiked mace balls and even what seemed to be an Iron Maiden. Devices of torture. But Henry Flagler showed his sign as he kept his hand here in the pocket. This is called the hidden hand, and that's exactly who these men are, the hidden hand behind everything. But on his lion's gate, I couldn't help but notice some unusual features. Notice here we have a couple of cherubim riding on fish monsters, and then in between them is a child in a portal, and what could be astronomical symbols of the crab and the lobster. But even more disconcerting was the next frame on the frieze, which showed these two merfolk angels pulling on a torch with an owl in the portal. And then some strange amphibian creatures, and what looks to be a quite traumatized angel in another portal. And I have found that these men, these ones that we call our leaders, are into traumatizing children. And they seem to have some strange connection to these merfolk or amphibians. Now the owl symbol came to light when Alex Jones snuck into Bohemian Grove. And he found many of the leaders of industry and of the government worshiping a 40-foot stone owl. And he equated this with the esoteric or occult orders of the Skull and Bones and even the Nazis. So I was really curious as to what these Satanists or these evildoers were really up to. And what was the symbol behind this owl? Because it seemed they burnt effigies of bodies to this 40-foot stone owl. And thank you, Alex, for sneaking in there and getting that footage for us. And the owl has always been connected with the goddess. And what you'll find is that even Isis, uh, Athena, or even the Hooters girls, <laughs> 
the owl and the goddess going hand in hand, the frost bank downtown also being an owl. This is our goddess Columbia. She is known as Venus, Isis, Minerva. She goes out through time. But the owl symbol is actually one to denote secrecy. Our goddess is known in Hebrew as the Shekinah, or the Shekinah. And you will find that uh, Saddam Hussein was actually placed into power due to the fact that he felt he was Nebuchadnezzar reincarnated. So when the Shekinah came down and struck Nebuchadnezzar using the mother of all bombs, shortened to the Moab, well, this was all ritual ceremony. It wasn't warfare. These are ritual ceremonies. Consider 911. The Twin Towers had a Masonic cornerstone lying ceremony on 911, 1966. The Pentagon had a Masonic cornerstone lying ceremony on 911, 1941. Hmm, curious that they would demolish these buildings on this same ritual date. As you know, if you've watched the Freeman Perspective, I am very curious about the goddess and her potential ET connections. Because as I look at her, and I find her as a symbol of the star cluster Sirius, I also find that Sirius is known for its fish people, or merfolk, as Atlantis was always known for its merfolk. And certainly trying to escape the UFO or ET connection with this goddess is a very difficult thing to do, because it pops up everywhere. So I sit and I contemplate on these signs and symbols that I find. Could it be that our leaders are connected with fish people from Sirius? Well, that's what the signs and symbols seem to show. This goddess is known as Venus, and Venus is known as Lucifer, so we could properly state that they are Luciferians. And one of her main symbols just happens to be the pentagram. She is the pentagram goddess. Now notice the Starbucks logo. Those are not her hands up by her head. Those are her ankles or her fins. This is how they used to describe sex with the fish people. So as we start to look at the different representations of our goddess, we find that she is always connected with this queen, Semiramis. The Dogon tribe also found themselves connected with the fish people. They were announced by... Uh, Robert K. Temple, as he discovered their connections and understanding their ancient mysteries with the merfolk. <clears throat> the queen is a representation of the draconians, whereas the pope is a representation of the Syrians. So let's consider what the ideas are behind the draconians and the Syrians. The draconians are known for controlling human elites, institutions, and financial systems, Militarism, creating a climate of scarcity, struggle, and insecurity. Harvesting humans, manipulating greys, and earth reptilians. Whereas the Syrians participate in technology exchange programs that promote military cooperation to potential extraterrestrial threats. Now does this not explain our monarchy and our religious leaders? Uh, is there not a super high-tech library under the Vatican? Does the queen not keep us in scarcity? Well, perhaps this might explain what I found inside of Flagler's College. Because certainly, there was a large phallus. And it rests inside of the vaginal opening of the fountain. Now, once again, this is the point within a circle. This is what is meant. Now, could they be talking about a sexual union with amphibians? Could it be a cross-beating program with extraterrestrials? Or maybe I'm just reading this thing. But certainly, I was a bit shocked as I walked over and found this fountain. Now, this is one evil-looking fish. <laughs> and just above this evil fish just happens to be a little boy holding his penis. Hmm. Well, we'll have to give this more thought. So the caduceus is often considered DNA, a symbol of DNA. So what would we have to say about this fish monster caduceus? I don't know. 
But I went looking for merfolk, and I sure found them. I had no idea if any of this stuff was here. Now, the Freemasons say that the, all the ancient astronomers saw the great symbols of masonry in the stars. Sirius still glitters as the blazing star, and that is this pentagram. And if you realize that the Egyptian hieroglyph for Sirius is an obelisk, a dome, and a pentagram, then we have very large hieroglyphs to Sirius in our capitals. And once you realize that in the Masonic cornerstones, they are not dated to the Gregorian calendar, but to the Anno Lucius calendar. That is actually the year 6007 to your leaders. They live even on another planet. Now, why is it that you don't know any of these things about these Freemasons? Well, notice here in the Nashville Lodge that there are no windows in the ritual area. They don't want you to know what's going on. And these are your leaders doing sacred rites in secret. Now, the Masonic Bible states that in a, the galaxy of notables in early American history, one finds these distinguished Masons, General George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Paul Revere, Alexander Hamilton, Patrick Henry. It is authentically reported that all but two of the generals in the Revolutionary War were Masons. And that's on both sides of the war line, because the British were all Masons as well. As the history of this nation continued and advanced along the lines of freedom, and brotherhood, many of the leaders in national affair, including the presidents, were illustrious Freemasons. Over 200 years, the destiny of this country has been determined largely by men who were members of the fr Freemasonic fraternity. Now look at this list of presidents. Over half of our presidents have belonged to the Masonic order, whereas 34 out of the 42 are all descended of the godman Charlemagne. We've never gotten rid of the royalty. We still live in a monarchy. It's just cloaked in the ideas that you believe are democracy. Now, the Freemasons define themselves as a science of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. Now, this has been stated often, but it is for each individual Mason to discover the secret of Masonry by reflection upon its symbols and wise consideration and analysis of what is said and done in the work, and that's within the rituals. Masonry does not inculcate her truths. She states them once and briefly, or perhaps darkly, and interposes a cloud between them and the eyes that would be dazzled by them. So... I think I'm doing a pretty good job of <laughs> deciphering the Masons because Pike clearly believed that virtually all important Masonic symbolism derived from the Kabbalah. Now, the Kabbalah is an exercise in the acquisition of intuitive knowledge or gnosis. And it, it expresses the great questions of the nature of God, the origin of the material world, and the relationship of God to man. The physical u universe is seen as the result of emanations of deity. Ten through the Sephirah. Now the Kabbalah comes down to us from ancient Egypt. And so on the courthouse out inside of Jackson, Mississippi, I found this winged uh, sphinx. Now this is, a, of course, the Egyptian symbolism coupled with the eagle. And then we find an obelisk surmounting a pyramid. And on top of it all, Moses, who brought the Kabbalah to the people in the book, the Sephir or what you know as the Pentateuch. Now, Madame Velatsky of the Theosophical Society says that the art of divine magic consists in the ability to perceive the essence of things in the light of nature, and by using the soul powers of the spirit to produce material things from the unseen universe. And in such operations, the above and the below must be brought together and made to act harmoniously. Magic is spiritual wisdom. Arcane knowledge misapplied is sorcery. Manley P. Hall, 33rd degree Freemason, uh, eminent scholar of Freemasonry, says ceremonial magic is the ancient art of invoking and controlling spirits by a scientific application of certain formulae. A magician enveloped in sanctified vestments and carrying a wand inscribed with hieroglyphic figures could by the power vested in certain words and symbols control the invisible inhabitants of the elements and of the astral world. While elaborate ceremonial magic of antiquity was not necessarily evil, there arose from its perversion several false schools of sorcery, or black magic. 
In Egypt, the black magicians of Atlantis continued to exercise their superhuman powers until they had completely undermined and corrupted the morals of the primitive mysteries. Thus, black magic dictated the state religion and paralyzed the intellectual and spiritual activities of the individual by demanding his complete and unhesitating acquiescence in the dogma formulated by the priestcraft. This was from the secret teachings of all ages. And we are still in this place today. Now there is a dark side to the Kabbalistic tree of life and it is known as the Quillipoth and is considered shells. It's also called excrement or feces. And some believe that it is the souls of those that died insane. They have names like the two contending forces, or the Hegelian dialectic, the burners, or what they do at Bohemian Grove, the liar, or poison of God, and even Lilith, the queen of night and demons. Now, the Quillipoth have a number, and the number of the Quillipoth is 66, and in Hebrew, 6 equals V. So what you have is VV, or W. So W actually is, well, by their own definition, excrement. And you'll notice here the Hierophant card in the Tarot, which is the V card. And you'll see the symbol of Mercury and Venus, and once again, back to the hermaphroditic symbols. Or even the Volkswagen logo is actually two Vs interlaced, making a third V, or 666. Have you ever wondered why Philip 66 is called such? So, in the blockbuster movie of Hollywood, The Revenge of the Sith, the latest of the Star Wars, they announce Execute Order 66. And what you'll find is that this movie was designed to express the decline and fall of the American Republic and being raised into an empire. And upon the, when the Emperor stood up and said, Execute Order 66, all hell broke loose and they started to kill all the good ones. And if it wasn't for the mind-controlled cloned army, none of this would have happened. But upon Order 66 or W, they started to eradicate everyone. But what is it that makes people so angry about all of this? I went down to try and figure out what they were up to. And I got down to the Guidestones. Now they're just sitting on a little dirt road there in Elberton, Georgia. They weren't much to look at from the road, but I found they had some curious anomalies. So I pulled up and gave it a look. There were certainly curious features to this thing, and I started thinking maybe there was more to it. So I gave it the once over. Now, the first thing I noticed was that the Guidestones were surrounded by holly wood, or holly plants. And this is a Celtic symbol of death and resurrection. And I found this symbol popping up often, as you will see throughout this talk. So the holly wood has been used to enchant us. It is an enchantment that's been placed, and as you see here, this guy, this, this fall guy, the original fall guy, was projected into our consciousness. And so now we have people dressing up as this dark slasher killer hero to protest <laughs> and try to keep the Masonic order in power. How curious is that? Wow. I happened to notice that the uh, Georgia Guidestones were created on March 22nd, which just happens to equal 322, which is the number of the Skull and Bones Society. And these Guidestones are put into eight different languages. And what you will find is that <coughs> language has frequency. So when you look at a, a language, you have to see it hieroglyphically and also archetypically. It is not simply a language, but a method that has been crafted by these magicians 
to express numbers, symbols, and ideas. They aren't simple words. And the very tones that are emanated, the very frequencies that the, Egypt, uh, that the language creates, has secret and hidden powers. Now, notice the Egyptian hieroglyphs. I see a flying saucer and then an owl. I find that rather curious. But also, the ancient Sumerian Babylonian form is represented on these guide stones. So could it be that there is more to this thing? Well, let's keep looking. Now, I kept noticing that there were these stains around each of the, the stones, and I, I really wondered what that was. Well, my answer came uh, in the form of an email. Well, now we know how the common man feels about the guide stones. But why are they so mad? Well, let's see what these things say. Maintain human humanity under 500 million people. Well, that's a lot of people missing. Guide reproduction wisely? Hmm. Uh, unite humanity with a living new language. Or creating a world court to resolve interna international laws. This thing seemed to be uh, ideas that could be okay if it weren't for the fact that we're being ruled by sorcerers. Now I noticed that it said leave room for nature, leave room for nature. And that this guide stone was also astronomically aligned, set up to watch the sun and other astronomical features. But I found this curious that if they were so involved and so curious about the time and what it was that perhaps they were thinking about. As here we have all the astronomical features, the sponsor of a small group of men, but they place this time capsule to be opened on when? The end of time, perhaps. As this made me think of the cross of Hinde, which is a symbol that has been deciphered by Falconelli back in 1926 in his book, The Mystery of the Cathedrals, which he found that this thing says, uh, O cross, our only hope, and equated these symbols to a revelation about a double catastrophe that was going to strike the earth with fire. And some believe he even deciphered a safe place to land. But these symbols on the base of the Hinde cross are all equated with the tarot, and they actually end with the last judgment. Now, the author of these guide stones was known as R.C. Christian, and it says a pseudonym. <laughs> and once again, either these guys are very uh, not paying attention or they're intentionally making these mistakes, just as the Cross of Hinde had mistakes that gave Falconelli the clues he needed. Now, Sir Francis Bacon was one of the Rosicrucians, and R.C. Christian is code for Christian Rosencruz, the founder of the Rosicrucian order. And as Shakespeare, or as he was known as Spear Shaker, he actually crafted the English language. So it is these high Illuminati, occult, esoteric Rosicrucians and other orders that actually manufacture our very reality, including our languages, our ideas of government, and everything else that we call the real world. So when I got to Denver and I was looking at the Masonic Lodge that's directly across the street from the Capitol, not only did I see their double-headed eagle, which is the symbol of the Hegelian dialectic, cause the problem, offer the solution, when it's all really one body, but I also happened to notice that there is a rose and a cross. Now it's said that the most secret symbols of the Masonic Order come from the Rosicrucians. But there were other anomalies on this guide stone. I happened to notice that certain areas of it were, remained rough, while others were polished smooth. And I thought perhaps maybe this was a tuning of the stone to a particular frequency, much like the inner chamber, or what we call the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid, has what they consider relieving stones 
but it has been found that these relieving stones also have rough and smooth areas and that they have been tuned to particular frequencies or tones, just like you would tighten a guitar string. But these stones are connected to channels which go to star clusters that I find very interesting, especially that of Sirius and Alpha Draconis, but also Orion and Ursa Minor. Now the pyramid sitting out in front of the Louvre just happens to be coated with 666 panes of glass. But could it be that these are not simple monuments, but actually devices, engineered geomancy or earth magic, that they're here to actually emit a particular frequency. So as I entered Tennessee, I happened to notice, well, how could you miss it? A large pyramid sitting off next to the Mississippi River. Now once again, this is a, a sports arena where they keep everybody in their basest human nature. I think that there's more to these pyramids than meets the eye. Now, the word for pharaoh and president could be interrelated. And what we find is the pharaonic men believed that they were descendant of the gods, that they were an interbreeding of the gods and man. And the word president actually means first man. And this particular god-man that stands in front of the Memphis pyramid just happens to be Ramses the Great, which just also happens to be W's relative. So now we see these Egyptian adornments all over our nation. This one's in Jackson, Mississippi, and well, you must realize that this is phallus worship, and that the power of the big red one does not mean a single unity, but a penis. And this penis is always connected with the goddess. So if you haven't figured out by now that Walt Disney is bad for your psyche, well, <laughs> you're not paying attention. So what you'll notice is that Walt Disney Co. is actually a military industrial corporation that seems to be crafting mind control slaves. You'll see here Walt Disney giving the right angle arm of the sign of the square of the Freemasons, just as Alan Moore is giving that same symbol. Now these are all equated. Walt Disney was a high-level Freemason that was hired by J. Edgar Hoover, who was a 33rd degree Mason, to instill thought patterns into the children. So when Madonna came down in her worshipful master's suit, wearing her top hat with the two Mouseketeers, Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera, I knew we were looking at a high-profile ritual. But it was actually when Madonna placed the hat upon Britney Spears that she passed her Madonna-ship onto Britney Spears, to the song, of course, of Hollywood. And there is that symbol of death and resurrection again. So out in front of the Jackson, Mississippi Capitol, I found the goddess placing the wreath upon another goddess's head, passing the generation down, and then always a dead soldier equated with this goddess. Even at the Temple of Athena, the Parthenon in Nashville, I found this same symbolism encoded up in the, the facade of this structure, you'll see there is a Nike or an angel victory placing the wreath upon well, the spear shaker Athena's head. And just up the street from the temple to Athena just happens to be the temple of Mars. And we're back to the hermaphroditic symbols. Now, of course, this Mars is also holding a Nike up in his hand. And she's carrying two rings. And of course, Mars is the god of war, and this is a war memorial we're looking at. Now the letter H in the Tarot is the letter of the emperor, and it has a meaning. It means window. So as we looked into this picture, I started to find all these Mars connections, and if you realize that Windows XP the XP is the symbol of the Cairo, and Cairo is the 
modern name for El Calhir, which actually is Mars. Cairo means Mars. So window XP actually means Emperor of Mars. Whereas the same symbolism shown in the History Channel logo, which is a red square. The square being a symbol of man, red being a symbol of Mars, the H being the Emperor. Could it be that these men are the Emperors of Mars? Well, certainly the Prometheus Mars mission shows Sumerian architecture on Mars. And there has been pyramids shown. And up on the Temple to Mars, I found these fasces. And this is the symbol of fascism. This is on a Freemasonic, government-sponsored monument. We have fascist symbols. It wasn't simply on the Temple of Mars, but also on the, this goddess temple, which is the war memorial in Jackson, Mississippi. Now what we find is, of course, once again, it's dedicated to the men who are sacrificed in these Illuminati rituals and adorned with each of the goddesses. Now it says, peace shall come to those who strive for peace. Now do you think all of these implements of destruction, these guns and these wars, and I mean the Russians just came up with a new bomb that surpasses the nuke. Do you think we're striving for peace here? And why is it the goddess is always shown with the dead men and the symbol of the fosses, or the fascist symbol? It wasn't just there, but it was on the door as well. This thing was covered in fascism. So what we'll find is that fascism should be more particularly or more properly stated as corporatism. And if you check my website at freemantv.com, you will find that each of the corporate logos can actually be identified by rituals or aspects of the Masonic ritual. All of them. Almost, I mean, all the top corporate logos. And so corporatism, we, we are grown up in a fascist state, a corporate state. And America has always been a fascist state. Any of you that think differently haven't looked deep enough or you haven't gotten past your mind pattern programming. So what is it with these godmen and their lineage? We find that they interbreed, that they constantly want to keep this particular DNA going straight down from the godmen to the presidents. As I mentioned, George Bush is a direct descendant of Ramses II. But not only that, he just happens to be the grandson of Aleister Crowley. Now, if you want the whole story, once again, go to freemantv.com, but just have a look, a picture here. If you tell me that Barbara Bush is not the daughter of Aleister Crowley, then, well, I say once again, you must be a little blind. Have a look at these faces and tell me that it's not true. So realize that our president is the grandson of what was known as the 666, the beast, the wickedest man in the world. And this might explain why Aleister Crowley's handwritten works are kept on the UT campus. Well, I figured uh, if we're looking at this dark secret, I better go talk to a Satanist and see what he thought about all of this. And so I met up with Rex Church, a high priest of the Church of Satan. I met him at a conference in Portland, Oregon that I was giving a talk at. Well, as synchronicity would have it, it just turned out that he also was in my speech and in my presentation. And he thanked me later because he was talking about, well, geomancy. And so I thought perhaps so, he could tell uh, us more. There's certainly something to be said about how the physical image affects people that see it. That's mm -hmm. the nature of propaganda. Mm -hmm. As a former psych warfare officer, I understand how that works. But you can only go so far with the image and you sometimes have to create things that are even more tangible, things you can feel as well as see. Painting is deception. When you create an image like that, it's uh, a trick of painting light and shadow to create an image that looks like something on a completely flat surface. It looks like three-dimensional, but it doesn't really have three dimensions. So there's a certain level of, of deception there, which would be completely appropriate for satanic art. But in wanting to be able to make bigger changes, it might be necessary to create uh, something that 
not only has physical presence, but is um, aligned to science, art, and the practice of black magic. And that would be a device that used aspects of the sacred cut, which is the phi ratio, which is found in all the world's great magical monuments from the Great Pyramid in Cheops to the Parthenon in, in uh, Greece, as well as um, what Mr. Freeman would have called um, uh, machines of the Guatu or uh, the... Uh, I don't Guatu actually know what a Guatu is. But they all use the sacred cuts and they're Masonry is the primary force behind the delivery of this, these angles and shapes down through history. They were the keepers of that. So when you talk about like how successful I might have been with this, this is still to be measured because my biggest experiment is in the area of aesthetic terrorism, which is the creation of devices that has create physical change as well as just through actual change in the residency of the world as opposed to just looking at them and then making people think things. So uh, I briefly touched on the idea of this machine and it uses metonymics which in its design, which are shapes that look like what they're supposed to do. So they are the equivalent, the physical equivalent of the onomatopoeia, the words that sound like what they're supposed to do. And it has, uh, uses Reiki and organic mist uh, and Tesla technology as well. And this is your, your Ragnarok engine? Yes. Yes. Okay. I really loved your presentation so far more than anything else I can say. Thank you. That's me. Thank you. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but this ring and ball configuration is it's huge. It weighs like two tons. Is it It's 12 inches. Yeah. Yeah, it moves. And it's, it has a variable speed rate. It can actually be changed. Change to the and the ball, uh, the ring are made out of T1, which is a hard and quenched steel. It's not like normal steel. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a structural steel that's just below the tool steel, but it's still harder than other material you find. These sigils are wrapped all the way around the inside of the ring, or on the outside of the ring on both sides. The side of it has, um, when I was talking about metonymics, which are shapes that look like they're supposed to do, it has these um, rods which extend out at the apexes of north, south, east, and west, which are um, shaped like the wound of fate in the runes of Futhark. They look kind of like a trident. And uh, so the uh, these arms can be positioned so that they will point at specific sigils on the ring so that when you turn it, they will actually be concentrating their force at that particular apex of, of, um, uh, of vibration. So they'll be pointing out these, these various areas. And mass in motion creates energy. The basic principle of you know, law of physics. Well, that gets amplified you know, as it moves and turns. And on the outside of the ball, besides the four uh, arms, it is a set of uh, spikes, which are like discharge spikes, where excess energy is like runs off. Of them. And uh, all of that is configured to certain numerals, certain numbers, and numerology, and the shape of the. Of the uh, we're, we're at, yeah, see you later. We're informal. We're informal. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, the shape of the trapezoid itself is all uses the phi ratio, which is against the sacred cut. And the masons are all about the use of the square and the compass and the caliber. Uh, well, ancient magicians and artists use these tools to create everything. But again, the function of art in the ancient world wasn't just beautifying buildings, it was psychic warfare. Emitting vibration. So things ancient. had to be made a specific way. So when people talk about a free-for-all within magic, it's like anything goes, like no, there are certain formulas, right. and they're mathematical, and they're provable. We can look at them, and we can weigh them against other things, and we can make replicate them again and again. So that type of magic is very, very specific and it has nothing in common with 
this kind of like, well, we can do whatever we want. We can add this, we can add a little of that. That's so right, right, so right, I'm yeah. very, very specific. Unlike surrealism, in my paintings, which they kind of just come to me and, and the work is manifest, whatever entity might be there at the time is kind of presenting themselves through me as a medium to, to, to paint them. And the symbols are open to interpretation. People say, oh, I see a face here, or I see this little thing here, and this symbol here seems to represent this certain idea. Or did you ever think that maybe this reminds you of this idea? The machine, on the other hand, is very, very specific. There's no room left for personal interpretation. It's very specific. <laughs> specific frequency, too. Uh, that's what I do. And know. it can be tuned to one magician. I guess like, well, a group of magicians. One magician to be able to tie in what is being done with it. And nobody what is else to be able purpose? to activate it. What, what? We all have our purpose. Yeah. Right. What is the device's purpose? Right. What is it's the purpose? It can be used for several different things, but at this point, my overall plan is that it's it's a device for for vengeance, for balancing back the world. It needs to be something like this. I mean, a portal like this could open up. Well, we've all heard the stories about you know at the at the end that would be the howl that would signify the coming of the old ones. So could our government be building geomantic or earth magic architecture into government structures to open portals for old ones, for demons to enter? Could be. I thought I better talk to one more person. And this is Paul Laffoley, and he is a, well, he was an architect for the Twin Towers until he was fired from that job for suggesting there be passageways between the two towers. You see, it seems they needed their symbol to be there of the Twin Towers. Now, Paul is a, a, an artist of extraordinary talent, and he has to be 100 or 200 years ahead of his time. He's a conceptual artist that designs time machines, and, well, we'll have him on the show to talk about it. But as I sat and chatted with him with my friend Ike Kapur, I, I brought him along as my magician's guide, uh, we talked to Paul Laffoley about a garden that he was constructing with Kabbalistic intent and how this functions inside of geomancy or earth magic. Paul's a very creative character and was a very interesting the, the, person. The one that I like is the, uh, is, is the earth and, and those 64 power points where, where you have the pyramids is point one. You know, and, and it's an icosahedral, pentagonal, dodecahedron system. Only now it's starting to become, you know, part, parts of, of, uh, uh, of, of, of six-pointed stars and five-pointed stars. So you have more, more, more power points and, and, and more ley lines because it started out as, as simply a tetrahedron. <laughs> and then it got more complex. And so when it finally gets so refined... The, kind of the, beyond a bug menace or... Right, yeah, oh yeah, no, it, that, that will, the world will blow up, you know, <laughs> when you get to that point. So the idea of geomancy, notice here, this is the Bicentennial Mall out in front of Nashville. And what it has is a seal of Solomon reconstructed as a garden. You'll see it just identical as this ancient seal of Solomon. And Solomon was known as one of the main magicians who built temples to Ashereth, the goddess, the vile goddess of the Sidonians, and for Shamash, who is equated with a sun god, or the vile god of Moab, and there's that Moab again, or Moloch, the detestable god of the people of the Ammon. Now, once again, this is the followers of Solomon or the Freemasons crafting geomantic devices or seals to bind spirits into structures. So as we start to look at this device, this instrument of the Illuminati, you'll see that it's incorporated with different chakra points, but it is actually the seal of Solomon to bind spirits in a life-size form. And you'll see that even the sign states that there are vast numbers of bodies interred under there. So they have actually crafted the Seal of Solomon on top of an ancient American burial ground. 
Imagine that, necromancy coupled with geomancy. What do you think these guys are up to, these sorcerers of Atlantis? Well, let's have a closer look at this thing. But now, wait a minute. No, that guy called me up in, in, in Tennessee, right? Yeah, it's in Tennessee. Okay, Tennessee. yeah, okay. He called me up about two years ago, or, or one of his representatives, mm -hmm. to design something like that, you know, something for a, a new... Uh, a, 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 a new worldview and this kind of stuff, and and so when I was hearing him talking over the phone, I I, I got a wiggy feeling that I shouldn't have anything to do with this character. So so I, I started funning him, and and that that set him off to a point where the phone slammed down. You know, so the, the, the obviously had no sense of humor, and and I, I cannot deal with people. That, that don't have a sense of humor because you can never you can never resolve any differences with them. Right. So I think that the guy was the guy was trying to hold on to uh, ideological control of this because he had a concept of a new world view which was probably different than mine. And uh, he was trying to find somebody that, that would acquiesce to it with uh, with awe. You know that that that, that kind of crap. So, oh. <laughs> this device was intended to be a Kabbalistic form of geomancy. I had no idea that Paul Offaly had been asked to be an architect. And I started noticing there were some stranger things going on in this Bicentennial Mall. This thing, William Henry, gave me a, a little tour, and he called this part the Stargate. And certainly it was disconcerting to see this black earth with its sun radiating deep down inside of it as it floated there on water. And then on these megalithic stones around it are scenes of war and death and destruction, even a nuclear explosion. But taken from certain angles, I, I could start to think that it was some sort of stargate or definitely some sort of device. But imagine my surprise when I happened to realize that those trees sitting behind it were none other than Hollywood. Once again, a symbol of death, death and resurrection to this brotherhood. So now you know why Hollywood is revered at Christmas time. Well, if you understand ball worship and its connection to Christmas. But I thought perhaps if this thing really was a Stargate, maybe, maybe, if I just got it going fast enough, I might be able to transport myself to another star system, just like in the movies. But that thing was heavy. <laughs> I wasn't going to get it rotating very fast at all. But would it work anyway? The sounds of the bells attracted my attention, and so I went to the crown of this Seal of Solomon, where I found 50 columns surrounding what would be the top of the keyhole. Now, each of these columns were 25 foot tall, and up at the top of which they had bells in the capitals. And in the center, I found that there was pentagrams and that this area was crafted of three different types of granite, a red granite, a blue granite, and a white granite. And each of these granites had different frequencies of quartz crystals inside of them. Recognize that your computer runs off of quartz crystals. That's what determines your megahertz. But in the center of these pentagrams, which just happens to be the seal of Tennessee, there is an iron post placed right down in the middle. And I found that this was for a phenomenal effect. I'm standing here at the crown chakra of the pillar of Meru, and I am uh, experiencing the acoustic effects 
that are caused by these that were set up so perfectly that my voice is reverberating, but only on this very spot where this iron rod is put down in the middle of this sanctuary. Astounding. Now imagine what would happen if you put the right tone right here and it all came back because no matter where I speak it comes back to me and it seems to come from behind me whichever direction I'm pointing so let's try pointing the camera this way and speaking that way how interesting is this now watch as I step off the iron post and we no longer get any reverberation. Not a single echo until I step back on to that post. From here, we don't get an echo. But as soon as I step right here, everything I say comes back at me. How amazing is that? Tell me this thing isn't an instrument, a device used by the Atlanteans. All right, bring me back. Now, what you must recognize is that there's more going on on planet Earth than you know. They have been lying to you, they've been hiding it, and it is these godmen this interbreeding genetic bloodline that rules our planet, that seem to have connections to the ancient civilizations. They have knowledge that's been encoded in the buildings, and they are using magical geomantic devices to intone p particular frequencies on planet Earth. So until next week, when we get into galactic history with Stuart Swerdlow, you have a good night.